I was recently on a, on a talk show. Uh, it's called Straight Talk. And the, the title of the show that day was, What is the Gospel? Uh, what is the Gospel of Jesus? And at an early point in the show, I asked the host, his name is Marlon Brown, I, I said, you know, you can have, just pose this question to the people that are watching the show, and they can submit all their answers in the chat box. And I, I, I prefaced that statement. I said to Marlon, I said, the gospel is, is, is highly misunderstood in the church. And I said, if you lined up 20 people and asked them, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? I said, you will get 20 different answers. And so he posed the question to the audience. And sure enough, we had a plethora of differing answers pop up in the chat as we went on with the show. Marlon asked me to return to his show on a weekly basis because in that hour-long segment, he felt like we were just skimming the surface. And um, he wants to do a, a little deeper dive. While I was serving here as, as the interim, um, we did a, a long segment on the gospel. And as I look back on that, I feel like we did a lot of skimming too. And I want to submerge. <laughs> so I've got a couple of things that I want to add to, to that story and to that message. So I, I, like I said, I want to take a little deeper dive and I'll tell you a little story. I've always loved to dive. Since I was a little boy, if I was in the water, I wanted to be under the water. I didn't want to be on top of the water. I wanted to be under the water. I loved that. And a few years ago, my bride and I, it's been probably been 10 years ago, I, I don't know, um, we took our certification so that we could go buy oxygen and you know, get our tanks filled. So we're, we're certified divers. And I think my bride would tell you that diving with me is, is more like uh, babysitting a sea otter. <laughs> because more than once, almost every dive, she's always grabbing my fin or my hose or something and dragging me back to the surface or back to the shore because we're running out of air, we're running out of time, she's watching stuff, she's playing it safe, and I'm diving. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's the way that it is. I, I thank the Lord for my bride. I was always chasing fish and, and trying to go deeper, and she's grabbing me saying, Time to go back. So for the sake of review and, and reestablishing our baseline, let me ask you, each one of you, just filter this in your minds. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Otherwise known as Yeshua. And Yeshua, thank you, Larry. Yeshua, in Hebrew, is a verbal deviation of to rescue um, or to deliver. And so what was the, the good news? The gospel means good news. What was the good news that Jesus preached? And what did he come to deliver us from? Now, I know that this is a good Bible-believing church, so let's dive in and see what the Bible says about the gospel. Matthew, you can, you can I'm not going to try to do this with my, with my Bible. I have it all wrote down here. So I'm going to start in Matthew 4, 17. I've got a lot of scriptures, but it's good because this tells us what the gospel is. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent of your sins, turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is here. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, same thing, it's here. And do you remember during during the, the time that we were going through this, what true repentance is? There were two Greek words, metanoio, uh, meaning to change one's mind and purpose as a result of after knowledge. So we learn something and we change our mind about it. And that verb with the cognate noun metanoia is used of true repentance. And that's a change of mind and purpose and life to which remission of sin is promised. 
We grow up thinking that repentance is kneeling down here at the altar and crying and being sorry about your sins. And that's not the true meaning of repentance. Repentance is to change your mind. Change your mind the way that you think about God. Amen. Yes. I see some heads. Yes, you got it. Yes. That makes me happy. Matthew 4.23, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. I was talking to my daughter on the phone this morning. I said, man, we need Jesus here because when he was here in the physical, he healed everybody. Everybody he came in contact with, he healed them. It was part and parcel with the gospel. He was preaching the gospel and healing people. Luke 4.43, but he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. That's why the Father sent him, was to preach the kingdom of God has come. It's here. Luke 8.1, soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. And during his three years of public ministry, the message did not change. It never changed. One day, the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You can't see it. It's not another church popped up on the corner. It's not the way that you dress. You cannot see the kingdom of God. Luke 17, 20 through 21. You won't be able to say here it is or there it is for the kingdom of God is already among you. They had to be going, what? What? Because they were looking for visible signs. We all, we all have that tendency. We want to see something. We can get behind something if we can see it. <laughs> but there are things that we can see. Evidence, evidence of the kingdom of God is found in lives that have been transformed by the power of God. Now, I was thinking on the way up here, I was thinking about this, and, and this, this portion that I'm going to go into right now, it might be more beneficial to you if you, if you imagine that your skin is a different tone, maybe a little darker, and imagine that you've been, you and your ancestors have been brutalized, and, and you've been in slavery, because black churches... They get excited about things. We don't get too excited, but I thought, because here's the, here's the evidence. The greedy become generous. The proud become humble. You can say amen. The arrogant become modest. Thieves become givers. Sexually promiscuous become pure. Strong-willed become gentle. The religious become real. The scared become like lions. The homeless find shelter. The hopeless find hope. The manipulators learn to adapt. I could go on. Those in turmoil will find peace. Those that cannot stop find rest. The drug addict finds happiness in a sober mind. Loners find families. The fatherless finds a father. The simple become great. These are evidences that the kingdom of God has come among us. It's impossible to remain the same when you step into the kingdom of God. It's impossible to remain the same. On the other hand, there's no way that anybody in the world can untangle themselves from the effects of sin outside of Christ. It's not possible. The gospel or the good news is this. 
God is here. Kingdom of God is here now. It's here. It's in your heart. That's where it is right now. One day we're going to see it cover the face of the earth. But right now the kingdom of God is here and it resides here. And it's evidenced by things that change in our lives, change the way that we think. If you say, if you think to yourself, I can't, I can't see it. I I just, I just can't see the kingdom of God being here right now. And maybe, maybe you haven't surrendered to it. Maybe you haven't handed your sword over and said, I will follow you. I'm done with my own way and my own will. This last week, there were two nights that I was just, and this is unlike me. I don't, I'm I don't, I'm not like a, a mystic or anything weird, but I was just overwhelmed with these dreams. And the second night I got up at, I don't know, two or three o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, and I wrote down this guy's name that was in my dream. I was thinking that I was being prompted to write a book about this, this man that was hiding. He was in hiding. I could tell you where he was. Anyway, I, I wrote the name down and I went back to bed and I got up the next day and I typed in the name. Wow. And a work by German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer entitled The Cost of Discipleship came up. I'm like, I've heard that name before. The most, and, and so the Lord wanted this to be a part of this sermon this morning. And he gave me these dreams. I got up and wrote down this name. And then I, the next day I find this guy online and and the most quoted portion of his work is this. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace, Bonhoeffer says, is to hear the gospel preached as follows. Of course you have sinned, but now everything is forgiven, so you can stay as you are and enjoy the Consolations of forgiveness. The main defect of such a proclamation is that it contains no demand for discipleship in contrast to costly grace. Costly grace confronts us as a gracious call to follow Jesus. It comes with a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit and the contrite heart. It is costly because it compels a man to submit to the yoke of Christ and to follow him. It is grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Bonhoeffer argues that as Christianity spread, the church became more secularized, accommodating the demands of obedience to Jesus to the requirements of society. In this way, he said the world was Christianized and grace became its common property. But the hazard of this was that the gospel was cheapened and in Christ was gradually lost beneath formula and ritual so that in the end, grace could literally be sold for monetary gain. So my point, I, I believe God's point in bringing that out, Great theologians with great minds and simple preachers like me are all saying the same thing. Being a partaker of the gospel of Jesus will cost you your kingdom, your rights, your views, your agendas. I'm not alone in this. Churches are one of the most dangerous places because we give license to power, pride, and privilege. And when I say that, it's when I look across the board at all the churches, I see it, I've witnessed it. With laser focus and obedience that cost him his life, he endured the shame, the humiliation, and suffering of the cross. He did not call his death good news. He did not call the resurrection good news, 
The good news, the gospel, was that God's kingdom was being established with mankind. God's big secret was being revealed. Did you know that God had a big secret? He was giving the Gentiles, or the rest of the world, us, access to himself. As stated in Colossians 1, 25-27, I have become its servant by the commission God gave to me to present you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Why should we focus on the gospel message that Jesus preached? Why should we just focus on the gospel? Other than the obvious answer, you know, Jesus, the commanders of the armies of the universe, he used it, he didn't change it. One of the first things that it does for me is it levels the playing field. The gospel levels the playing field. The kingdom message is the only message that will bring about the unity that Jeremiah prayed for this morning. The unity that that Jim preached two weeks ago right here. The unity between the Father and the Son and us and them. Why do I say that? Here we go. Now we're going to now we're going to under hold your breath. When you ask questions like this, why are there so many denominations? Why are there so many factions? Why are there so many conflicts within the church? And when you gather up all the answers from questions like that, and then you submit those answers to the kingdom of God, They dissipate. Think about it. What man can stand and argue against God? What argument can you have against any brother or sister when standing before God? Or, or this, is, this is funny. What kind of a doctrinal argument can you stand before God and have? Can you take it before God and say, Hey, hey God, I know you made the universe and... You made the planets and you made the earth and you made the sea and you filled it up and life comes up out of it and you made us and you made our bodies. But I got this thing about Calvinism and Arminianism that I want to talk to you. Do you see how foolish that would look? So preaching the kingdom of God, it does away with arguments that are foolish and have no place. How is it, out of all the religious organizations in the world, we have seemed to have lost the very thing that Christ said that he came to teach? Why is it that we focus at the door, that is the cross, but we stop there and we don't bother going through? We don't walk in the kingdom. Where's the unity? Where's the love among the believers? Why is this not working? It's because of the message. The kingdom of God needs to be preached like Jesus preached it. Because when you preach the kingdom, people understand that they've got to surrender. In God's kingdom, there's only one king and there's only one set of rules. Outside of God's kingdom are many kingdoms. Each one of us, we have our own. It's chaos out there. Each man, woman, and child, they have their own will. If you've raised children, you understand. (laughs) It's, It's funny, those tender little children, as they grow and just small little children, their wills become known. So what's the cure? It's the gospel message. It's never changed. Jesus didn't change it, and I see no need to change it either. The kingdom of God has come. Change your mind about who and what you want to serve. Surrender your kingdom. 
and live in God's kingdom. You may say, well, I serve in the church. And that's nice, but are you serving your family? You may say, I love coming here where everyone knows my name, like Cheers. Remember the old movie? And that's nice, but do you know your neighbor's name? Because see, being in the kingdom of God means that you love your neighbor also. The things that Jesus taught, the things that he shared, the parables, the stories. When I came back in July, I told a little story about a little fictional rural town, rural town called the Outpost, and, and there was another town. And the story was based on kingdom principles. Their war was raging, casualties were mounting, but the folks in the Outpost had figured out who they were fighting and how to do spiritual battle. They, they all considered themselves and, as enlisted. Each and every individual had a position, had a job to do, an area of responsibility that all contributed to the well-being of the whole, contributed to the well-being. Those who stood on the walls didn't consider themselves as more important than those who prepared food for them to eat. It's a kingdom principle. The, the playing field has been leveled. It was an all-volunteer workforce. There was no one serving against his or her will. Rather, each person's giftedness was used best to serve the whole. And they all understood that through the ancient writings, i.e. the Bible, that it was God Almighty who had placed each person in this force and in their position, and He created each one of us in a specific way to serve others. I think that we over romanticize spiritual battle. Instead of putting on the armor of God, we put on religion. But religion that's not rooted and grounded in the gospel that Jesus preached is corrupt and powerless. The gospel was foundational to all of Paul's teachings. And here's just a few of Paul's comments about the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9.18 What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel... I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher. Philippians 1.27, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9.16, Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. Galatians 1.7, Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. My friends, that hasn't stopped. The world still continues to pervert the gospel of Christ. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. There are many more, but my point is that Paul was preaching the gospel of Jesus. He definitely uh, challenged us in, in a lot of areas, but everything that he taught, everything that he preached, the foundation was the gospel. I've, I've told people, I said, I think that we have, when, when people try to deep dive into the epistles and become really spiritually minded without, without a foundation, what were we singing this morning? On Christ, the solid rock I stand. That foundation, if you don't have that foundation underneath your feet and you try to go on and grow up to be spiritual, you become morphed, deformed. Deformed Christians. You've got to have the foundation of Jesus Christ. Everything that He taught. You've got to know the red letters. You've got to know what it is to walk in the kingdom. What does it mean? Let me, let me, here, bear with me for a moment. Let me, let me play the prophet. Jesus gave us insight into divine principles. And one of them was, was this, any house divided against itself will fall. And that's not hard to understand because when governments become so fractured, civil war breaks out, uh, someone's ideals are crushed, and other ones are lifted up. 
when churches are divided, you know what happens. Churches, more than anything else, should be aligning themselves with God's kingdom. We need to examine how and what we are building if our structure is patterned after the kingdom, after the word. Example, what's the power structure look like? Is it hierarchical? Hierarchical? I can never can't say that word. <laughs> Where you have one or two guys at the top and they tell everybody else what to do? Are titles and positions, are they used and abused? You may be thinking to yourself, well, yeah, we've got, we've got titles. Uh, we've got New Testament tells us that we can appoint deacons and deaconesses and elders and pastors. But here's the rub. Jesus gave us the guidelines for this. He said to the crowds, to his his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden I don't know about you, but in today's world, in religious organizations, I see that same thing time and time and time again, where religious leaders, call them pastors if you will, won't lift a finger to do the day-to-day mundane things that it takes to keep a church together and growing. They're above that. I recently spoke to a young man who was working with a group of people and I encouraged him. I said, well, make sure you get in there and help them with that project. And he laughed. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm paid to tell other people what to do. And that was a generational thing. This is where our church leadership is going. I'm paid to tell you what to do. That is a sad commentary. It's no different than than what was happening there with religious leaders. Jesus went on and said, Don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher, and all of you are equal as brothers and sisters. There's our level playing field. You're my brother. I'm your brother. I'm new better than you are because I'm up here. You're my sister. Lisa, it's funny, when I came in this morning, she says, man, I was thinking, man, he has Lonnie's eyes. I'd shave my beard off. (laughs) Thank you, Lisa, for recognizing my eyes. We're no better than each other, no matter what we're doing in the church. No matter what we're doing. It's a crime when we do that because it goes against, it violates the constitution of the kingdom of God. Christ came, we have one king, just one. We all have different functions, but we're serving him, and we're serving together. Titles were made for man. Man was not made for a title. Or you do not hold title of pastor, deacon, or deaconess in order to serve. Let me say that again. You don't hold title of pastor, deacon, or deacon, or elder to serve. You serve, and then your giftedness, where you're serving, we'll put a title to it. Well, look at that. He's acting just like an elder. Well, that guy, he's a pastor. That, that, that gal, she's a deaconess. She serves the entire community. We've kind of been doing it backwards, people. So what is the gospel? It's to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what does that mean? Each and every moment of our lives, it means that we follow the teachings of our king. Jesus didn't say, no, no, no. (laughs) I'm paid to tell them what to do. He led his gang. He led them. They walked with him. They followed him. And they learned from him by what he was doing. That's the kind of example that I want to be. How about you? 
I pray that God helps us realign our thinking with true kingdom thinking. 